The brain is the most complex human organ, and in this video, I'm going to try to program an AI to function just like it. The idea for this video struck me after watching an episode of Mindfield, where Michael made a brain out of people. His brain could process sight by recognizing the numbers 0 through 9, and I want my brain to be able to do the same. If it can be done with people, surely I can do it with my computer, right? Before we can make the AI work like an actual brain, we need to know how a brain actually works. This is not an easy task, because apparently, according to experts and scopelog.stanford.edu, we know very little about the brain. Well, isn't that just great? And I'm not trying to spend eight years getting a PhD in neuroscience just to make a 10 minute YouTube video, so I have to turn to my good friend, Wikipedia. After skimming through a couple Wikipedia pages and then rewatching the Minefield episode, it's time for our first segment of learning how a brain works from someone who has no idea what he's talking about. When you see, the very first thing that happens is light makes its way into your eyes. It gets focused into your pupil and then hits your retina. In the retina, there are photoreceptors, which you might know as cones and rods. When the photoreceptor gets hit with light, it does some sort of chemical reaction to make an electrical signal that goes through the optic nerve in the back of your eye, and then straight to your brain. So let's pause here and make that. After whipping up this little UI and adding a spot where I can draw my numbers, I had the eye break the image up into a grid of smaller sections based on a variable I called resolution. Each cell in the grid loops over every single pixel in its section and then averages it with the others, and if that average is larger than a certain activation threshold, the photoreceptor will activate. Now this totally works, but there's one small problem. It's slower than a sloth without any limbs. This is because it has to loop over all of the pixels every frame and average them together. Here we're getting like 12 FPS, and this needs to be faster. One way of speeding this up is to loop through all the pixels every 0.5 seconds instead of every frame, which works nicely most of the time, but every 0.5 seconds it annoyingly slows down and then speeds back up. A better solution is to harness the power of statistics and realize that we don't need to have a perfect exact average. We just need to see if it is above an activation threshold, 0.1 in this case. We could estimate the average by randomly sampling points, say 100 pixels per grid, and then averaging them together. This speeds things up a lot, but the one downside is that there is a small chance that the test could result like every COVID test I've ever taken. A false positive. That just means that the photoreceptor could activate when it really shouldn't because of the randomness. Once all that was implemented, we have simulated the eye looking into an image, receiving light that hits a photoreceptor, which will activate when it's above a certain threshold. All of the cells then say whether they're activated or not, and they send this information down the optic nerve to the primary visual cortex. Now it's time for another segment of overconfident and incredibly unqualified boy explains stuff that scientists still don't fully understand. The primary visual cortex, otherwise known as V1, is responsible for detecting edges, orientations, and spatial frequencies. The information processed in V1 then gets passed into V2, where the edges are put together to make forms and different shapes. V3 is irrelevant to us because it handles color, but V4 combines the different forms in V2 into something we start to recognize. This seems like a good place to pause, so let's start coding this cranium. Starting with V1, we need to get a list of all the lines in the image, and according to, well, geometry, we can have lines at all angles, but I'm going to focus on making vertical and horizontal lines, not because I'm lazy and it seems like a lot more work later on, but, well, fine, you got me, it's because I'm lazy and it seems like it's a lot more work later on, jeez. So anyways, we can start making lines by finding where two cells are adjacent and activated. I call these pairings. Then combining all the stuff from the list of pairings lets us create the lines. And this wasn't all that bad. It's not like I had to spend days writing a complex recursive function that I had to call on each line to split them up into segments or anything like that. So, phew. In V2, I had the brain use the lines from V1 to make three different shapes. A corner, a T-junction, and an intersection. We can detect corners by seeing if a horizontal line and a vertical line meet up at an endpoint. We can do the same thing for the T-junction, but instead just detect if an endpoint meets a middle point. And intersections work by comparing the middle points to the middle points. When those bad puppies get detected, I throw them into a list and send them off to V4, which starts to form more recognizable things. 
Now, before we jump into V4, let's just take a look at all the numbers. The first thing I notice is that there are a lot more corners than intersections and T-junctions, and most of the digits are made up of U's and zigzags. So before I work on V4, I actually went back into V2 and removed the intersections and T-junctions. Using only the information I had from the corners, I was able to detect when they come together to create U segments and zigzag segments. The brain worked well by identifying the zigzag segments and U segments alone, but when they start intersecting, the brain doesn't do too hot. Look at this T. Previously, the brain identified it as one T junction. Now that there are no such thing as T junctions, the brain thinks that it's just nothing because corners need to start at the start of a line. Now I have two choices. I could split the lines so this T could actually be three lines instead of two, or I could remake corners so they could start and end anywhere. All right guys, so heads is gonna be splitting up the lines and tails will be remaking the corners. Three, two, one. Now, how do we go about splitting lines? Well, um, it shouldn't be too bad. It's just a line after all. Uh, I think I'll just wing it. Back to V1 I go. Three days later. Yeah, so maybe that was a bad idea. Just winging it meant I had to restart multiple times. The way I ended up doing it was a bit confusing, so I won't spend too long on it, but just know I spent days writing some complex recursive function called on the line segments to split them up into smaller segments. I am very proud of myself for making this big brain line splitting algorithm, yet again, it did take multiple days to turn this into this. So now that V1 is back up and running, the corners can properly be detected. So my U and zigzag segments are also being recognized correctly. This wraps up the visual cortex, and we are now moving into a brand new part of the brain. And you know what that means. Time for our final segment of person who took high school biology four years ago attempts to explain the complexities of neuroscience. After V4 collects its groupings of somewhat recognizable figures, it sends them to a new part of the brain called the infratemporal cortex, or IT for short. I'm gonna keep calling it the infratemporal cortex because it makes me seem smarter than I actually am. The infratemporal cortex's job is to look at all of the information from the visual cortex and make a guess about what it sees. For example, if it sees one vertical line, it's pretty sure it's looking at a one, so that's what it will guess. The way I went about coding it is that I made an abstract class called IT Neuron, and each child class is responsible for predicting a number. So in total, we have 10 distinct IT Neuron classes. In each class, there is a function that determines whether or not the neuron sees its number, and it just checks to see if the specific features are present. Let's look at a quick example. Take this digit right here. What do you think it is? Well, let's see what the three neuron has to say. First, we're gonna get a list of the left U segments, and we're gonna check that there are at least two of them. Now, we check to see if the bottom left point on one of them is below the bottom left point on the other. And if it is, we are gonna activate the neuron because the criteria for a three is met. See, a perfect prediction. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Yep, it really just did that. I think our brain might just have some brain damage. That is clearly an eight, but our brain thinks it's a three. Or it does it. But alas, dearest viewer, for I never said the brain thought this was a three. I simply stated that the three neuron activated. However, it did not activate alone, but rather along with the seven neuron, the one neuron, and indeed the eight neuron. It decides its final guess of which number to choose based on a specific priority I manually set based on how complex the number is. Because seven outranks the one, and the three outranks the seven, and the eight outranks the three, our brain will make a final guess of the correct number, eight. Now it's time to put this brain to the test, to see if it is a piece of trash, or potentially smarter than humans. This test consists of two rounds, one where the grid is five by five, and I have the grid lines on, and another where I have the grid at seven by seven, with the grid lines off. Each round will also last 10 minutes, three, Two, one, go. While this test is happening, I quickly want to talk about something many of you may have been thinking this whole time, neural networks. I am aware of their existence, and I know they're based on how the brain works, 
but that's about it. I wanted to have as little knowledge as possible about them going into this, so I wouldn't end up just making one. I wanted to try my best to understand what the brain does and then execute that in code. And it looks like round one is wrapping up. So let's check the results. 91% accurate. That's not awful, but I was hoping to get a bit higher during this round at least. Okay, let's get round two going. Three, two, one, go. During round one, I tried my best to help the brain out as much as possible with keeping the grid on and writing in a slightly unnatural way so the brain would understand. Now in round two, I have the grid off and I increased the resolution to seven. So I'm writing on an invisible seven by seven grid. I am also trying to write much more naturally here. And spoiler alert, the results show it. The main reason it sucks when you aren't helping it out is that it will count the lines right on the edge of two cells by activating both cells. So say I make a big horizontal line. Not only will that lead to the brain seeing two horizontal lines, but also a bunch of vertical lines connecting the horizontal lines together. No bueno. It also does not handle diagonals or curves, which is more of a challenge with higher resolutions. Anyways, the results are in, and round two finished with an accuracy of Drum roll please, 55%. Now, that may seem bad, but it's a three on the AP test, which is technically passing, so I'm taking it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know the results were incredibly impressive, but that just goes to show how good our brains really are. I would totally be interested in another exploration style video like this, but focused on learning how neural networks work, if there's enough interest for that. Also, I know I picked up a bunch of new subscribers in the past month, so welcome everybody. If you're looking for something else, here's something YouTube thinks you would like. And you know what YouTube, I agree, that is a fantastic recommendation. Also, I rarely plug my social media accounts, but I'm going to start posting some behind the scenes and bonus stuff over there too, so links in the description. Thanks again, see you soon.